along with, I think, last week's chapter I still need to post up as well. But uh, let's go ahead and let's take a look at chapter 12, and we're going to talk about uh, marketing. Now, uh, when we think about marketing, I think we tend to think about just one aspect of marketing, which is just the advertising aspect of marketing, which is part of the overall uh, marketing process. But marketing goes beyond um, just advertising. In fact, that's almost the uh, middle part of it. Uh, marketing really starts with identifying a uh, consumer need or a market niche, as they call it, a need and then trying to fill that need and then going through the process to where we ultimately providing that product or service uh, to consumers, okay? So there are some marketing fundamentals, including, again, the communication of society's needs, wants, understanding what those are, um, then filling those, um, and then communicating that so that uh, individuals are aware that uh, we have something that will help meet those needs, Establishing pricing static strategies, uh, promoting the product's benefits, uh, distribution of the product is actually marketing, and then maintaining a uh, customer relationship. You think, well, gee, that's not marketing because that should be after the marketing, but that in itself can be marketing as well. Uh, if we're selling the uh, customer service as part of the overall product, or maybe the product is the actual service itself, um, but also using that relationship to help uh, promote additional sales, additional products, etc. So that's all part of marketing as well. Okay. Now when we take a look at uh, sort of the evolution of marketing, uh, it has uh, you know, changed over the years, but the core of all of these still remains. So even though um, we've added some components, I guess, in the best way to look at this over the years, we still maintain, for example, the core of having to have a product, of course, to produce. But, um, you know, in the uh, 30s, the idea was, in the 1920s and 30s, the idea was what? Well, we'll just go ahead and uh, we'll produce the product and we'll produce such a quality product that everyone will just step up and have to buy our product, however it is that we produce it. And they mentioned the uh, Ford Model T. Uh, Model T was uh, sort of the original vehicle that everyone could afford. They had a Model A before that that was, you know, uh, a little more fancy, I guess. And then uh, they came up with this Model T and started to mass produce that. And they were able to produce it at such a cost that uh, more and more people could afford a Model T. But uh, Ford used to say that uh, my customers can have the car any color they like as long as it's black. Okay, so it was just say, take it as it comes out, right? All the Model Ts uh, were black, okay? Then what? Then we started to go in in the late 30s and we started to come up with products that were uh, supposedly going to, you know, meet a, uh, a need that was in the market and we would do some work to try to actually uh, sell that product um, to somebody. So we had these door-to-door -door sales and we would sell these things, fuller brushes, um, vacuum cleaners, that sort of thing, and we would actually start to try to push that sale. Of course, if we were going to push the sale, then we had to be a little more sensitive to the needs of the market, and uh, that's when you started having, uh, basically, uh, for example, Dodge came out of the idea, Dodge vehicles came out of the idea that, no, we're going to provide more variety to the vehicles, and it's not just going to be this one, uh, you know, type, color, Model T. Um, then what? Then we have uh, the marketing getting more involved. We start uh, advertising our products, uh, you know, McDonald's, have a great day, and all that sort of stuff. And started to get more into uh, pushing the marketing in the 50s. And we did this more because by now World War II is over, and you have, what, pent-up demand. You have, what, you have more of a, a, a buyer's market. And so we had to start to uh, diversify uh, more to be able to, uh, you know, provide different products and, and actually market those. Societal marketing, um, you know, now companies tend to think more about other factors such as environment, etc. And then finally, a uh, customer relationship in which we are really trying to maintain an ongoing relationship with the customer. And they mentioned, for example, Amazon, Ritz Hotels, 
and you think about it, uh, this is much of how marketing is done today. Um, I don't know. I don't know how they're watching me, but you know, it seems like every time I like look at one thing, all of a sudden I start getting all of these, you know, emails and things on Facebook saying, "Oh, you know, uh, you looked up uh, a shirt. Uh, here's ten other shirts that look just like this one, or something, or you might be interested." as well, right? Or I clicked on one, uh, this housing development that's in the wine country, and I clicked on it because I'm okay, housing development in the wine country. Now I'm constantly getting things on my uh, email about this home and that home and that sort of thing. So they're, they're watching you, and they're figuring out what uh, your needs are, and they're trying to maintain a, a customer relationship with you. Um, so that's uh, sort of where we are now in terms of, uh, of how uh, marketing goes. Amazon, once you buy something from them, they're going to keep what? They're going to keep sending you other stuff that's like that, etc. Right? So, okay. okay, good. Uh, now, you go through and we talk about these different eras. Production era, again, 1920s, limited suppliers, strong demand. Good product quality, the Model T, hey, any color as long as it's black, right? Then what? Then we move into the sales era in the 50s, um, you know, greater demand, greater competition, and so we start getting more into advertising, okay? Okay, good. So we come over and we talk about this marketing concept era, which is where we are now, right? and commitment to the total organization of delivering superior products, services, is where we tend to be, develop products that meet customers' need, and focus on products uh, with the highest profit is, uh, tends to be where we are now with the way we uh, market things. Okay. Uh, societal marketing, okay, 1960s, 70s, challenge companies to come up with a societal uh, angle while making a profit, and then uh, customer relationship area. Yes, we have the market, we have the sale, uh, we get feedback, and then we continue to provide uh, support to our customers to understand what their uh, different needs are and try to provide them additional products that will support whatever their needs are. That's why Amazon continues to send you a, you know, you bought an accounting book. Well, here's 10 other accounting books that you might think are uh, useful, so it's trying to support uh, on a daily basis. Okay. Uh, not-for-profit organizations. Uh, I think some of the not-for-profit organizations, in my opinion, I uh, have the best marketing, the best uh, advertising. You know, when I see uh, these commercials uh, now about uh, texting and driving, they have one where uh, the girl is, you know, down in hell, and she was texting while she was driving, and she's saying, gee, how come I can't get a signal in here? And that kind of stuff. These type of things uh, are pretty good. They get you to, uh, to think a little bit more. I remember uh, one of the more powerful uh, ones that I saw was from the American Cancer uh, Society, and that they had a... Uh, there was two that I saw. When I was the housekeeper of the hospital, American Cancer Society... Uh, used to rent some space at the hospital, so I would go in and clean up that office space from time to time. They always had all these little pamphlets, and I used, used to sit there and look at the pamphlets because I was going to school taking a marketing class, and I used to think, man, this is some great marketing. Uh, they had one where they showed a fetus inside of, you know, the egg, the little, I don't know what you call that, where the fetus sits inside. But anyway, the fetus is in there doing what? Smoking a cigarette. Okay, so the idea being what, if you're pregnant and you're smoking, the baby is smoking, right? And so that was like, oh, that really, you know, gives you an image that um, you last. The other one was, it was a picture of a cigarette that started out as a cigarette, and then as it extended, it turned into a shotgun and came and was aiming back towards whoever was smoking that cigarette, right? So they have these kinds of things now, and they... This uh, drunk driving, uh, you know, buzz driving is drunk driving thing. I noticed they're working at all different angles on that. They have, you know, sort of more gory, um, you know, an accident happens and someone is killed because of it. But then they also have some of these where, you know, hey, you're going to have to pay a fine and you're going to, you know, look bad in front of your friends when you get arrested. And so they're using what? They're using um, a lot of different 
uh, modes of advertising that uh, and appealing to a lot of different aspects, uh, pathos, that sort of thing, uh, in not-for-profit advertising. So I think they're actually um, pretty good these days in not-for-profits, and I think they always have been. Okay, so just a little bit of uh, information there about the different marketing strategies. So in a seller's market, what happens? Demand exceeds supply. And that's what we had early on with the Model T, that sort of thing, right? And that's how come the sellers could just tell you, hey, we want things to, uh, you know, we can get on one of our vehicles, it's going to be black, right? Okay. Uh, the Airman companies believed that a good quality product would simply sell itself. That was in the 20s, again, uh, going back to the uh, Model T era. Okay. Which of the following tools is not used to remain customer, uh, retain customers in order to stimulate uh, future sales of similar supplementary products? Uh, heavy public advertising will not do that for us, right? Uh, we want to maintain customers in a customer relationship. Yeah, IT, for example, the information technology, with the Facebook and all that sitting there and us, you know, that's another thing, I'm, I mean, I'm talking about emails, but it'll happen the same thing on Facebook, that when you go and you do your news feeds, all of a sudden you start getting all these things in news feeds, and I don't know how they figure out that I one time clicked on this, and now, you know, they're going to put that on my news feeds all the time, but they do. Uh, coupons, right, is an example. Hey, you know, you come in. Um, when I go to, uh, like, I need to go to Baskin Robbins, but sometimes I do, and they always give you a coupon to come back, you know, get a dollar off on the next thing, right? So they're trying to maintain customer relationship, uh, good customer service. Um, you know, you get somebody that helps you to set up a particular uh, aspect of your business or your home or whatever, you'll probably go back to that person again, okay? And then again, suggestions for future purchases. However, you end up doing that uh, through uh, direct mailing or through Facebook, social media, all of these would be ways. But uh, heavy public advertising is not directed to that individual customer need, right? Just a sort of a broad, uh, you know, those things you get in the, for uh, Black Friday. They put that in everybody's mailbox, right? And so uh, that's not something that's you know, from the customer relationship side. Okay, okay, benefits of marketing, okay, now I think that we tend to think of marketing as maybe a little bit intrusive, and there is a certain amount, a uh, certain aspect of that, but also what, uh, it's good for society for us to understand what the needs are of society, and through marketing we meet those needs, right, okay, also investors uh, and employees are benefit. Benefited by our marketing efforts, obviously sellers and ultimately consumers could be benefited. Now, what are the types of benefits? We could have utility benefits. So what happens? Well, there's a sheep sitting in the, uh, where the sheep sit, in the fields, wherever they are. And you sit there and you go, boy, that sheep looks nice and warm, doesn't it? Gee, I wish I was warm like that. Well, part of marketing is doing what? Taking the wool and turning it into a what? A sweater that somebody could wear and so we have what we have creating a finished goods from raw materials uh, type of marketing task utility performing a desired service you know um, gee you know I could go and uh, and uh, do, do some sort of uh, fishing or something but Paul over here is much better at fishing and so why don't I go ahead and what, turn that uh, service over to him, that task over to him, and uh, then maybe I'll provide him with a sweater instead, right? All of this is going to be marketing since I have sheet. Time utility, delivering the product when the customer wants it. I mean, whether you realize it or not, your phone is giving you time utility, isn't it? Think about it. Prior to that, what did you have to do? Well, okay, I'll talk to so-and-so when I see him again, I guess, right? Then with the telephone, no, I'll talk to so-and-so right now. I'll send a text message to so-and-so right now, right? And I'll look up something on my phone right now, and I don't have to wait until uh, I'm in the store or something like that, right? Place utility, uh, delivering the product when the customer wants it. Um, so basically, 
a store that has something in stock when you go there and buy it is providing you what? Is providing you place utility, right? Okay. And then ownership utility is provided by the fact that they will actually sell you the item and you can have ownership so you can basically do whatever you want with it. Like if you buy a house or something like that, it's going to be ownership utility. Okay, so all of these uh, comes as uh, different forms of uh, utility and benefits that are provided through marketing. Okay. Now there's also criticism of marketing, uh, misuse of personal information. I, mean, I don't think that you know they're misusing my personal information. I mean, yeah, I sit there and you know that I clicked on something, and now they're going to turn around and try to you know sell me everything that's in the ballpark close to that. But misuse of personal information might be without the client's permission, selling their data, etc., to uh, marketers that sort of thing. Hidden fees, okay, these things go on. Um, I was actually over at uh, Best Buy. I was going to buy something for my living room, and I was ready to buy the thing until they showed me that they're going to charge me for every single installation, not of, you know, the whole thing that I was buying, but what? Every single item had a couple of different charges associated with it. Now, that wasn't really hidden, but it was sort of like after I got all, you know, sort of pictured myself with all this stuff in my living room, then they start telling me about all these different fees. And because of those fees, I didn't get it. And I tried to point out to them, I said, you know, guys, you might want to think about is your contribution margin towards the company bigger on the product or on those fees you're charging? Because if it is, you should have erased those fees to get me to what? Uh, to purchase the item with the bigger contribution margin. Of course, they looked at me like, what's the contribution margin, right? But uh, that was uh, sort of the uh, the way that whole conversation went. But I ended up not getting it because I was pissed off at that point because of the hidden fees. Uh, consequence of purchase, obviously what? Cigarettes having a huge uh, consequence of purchase, okay? Now, you come over and uh, I decided to put these in because when I was looking at these hidden fees, uh, I started thinking of this handy dandy uh, vacuum cleaner. Okay, and it was this episode. Did you guys ever see I Love Lucy? Did you ever see that TV show, old old TV show? And the guy comes in to sell her a handy dandy vacuum cleaner and he shows her how it cleans up. And she says, Oh, okay, I'll take it. I would love the handy dandy vacuum cleaner. So she buys it and then they turn around and he says, Oh, of course, you want the hose to go with that, right? So they sell her the vacuum cleaner, but not the hose, right? They keep going, and they sell her the electrical cord as a separate uh, item. Well, you want the electrical cord to go with it, don't you? And so she kept getting deeper and deeper and paid more and more for this thing until she ended up having to become a salesperson of the vacuum cleaner herself to pay for the thing. So, um, you know, again, those hidden fees ideas or something that... Uh, you know, uh, really can be a criticism of marketing. We get you to buy the main thing, and then we keep trying to do all these add-ons. That was the handy dandy vacuum cleaner. Okay? All right. So we come over, and we take a look at our uh, marketing strategy. Okay? And we have what they call the four Ps, okay? Which, of course, we have to have a product. We, of course, have to have a price that is going to be competitive. We will then go ahead and promote that product, typically through advertising, whatever. And then, of course, we can provide what? Place utility, and then someone can just walk into Target uh -huh, and what? pick up that item, uh, whatever it is. So we think about all of these different things in terms of our uh, marketing strategy, and we then um, focus that on a target market. So a target market is what? Target market is individuals uh, 18 to 24, um, individuals you know uh, 35 to 50 with disposable income of certain levels, and all of those target market decisions are going. Or target markets are going to allow us to make decisions about price. So if we're talking about someone 18 to 22, maybe they're still in college. Price is going to be something that we're going to try to keep a control on, right? As we get into individuals 35 to 50, maybe have larger disposable income, so price may not be as much of a deal as what is trying to make the product um, something that uh, you know they feel is worth their while to uh, to uh, purchase. How we promote it, okay? We'll use what 
will probably use more um, um, I forget what they call it, but when you try to make something seem expensive and classy, um, that's a type of marketing that will maybe appeal to somebody who's now feeling like their disposable income is growing and they're going to be more inclined uh, to purchase that. So all of these are um, different uh, things that we think about the four P's in our marketing. Okay? Now, um, so we talk about product differentiation. Price, obviously, promotion, form of promotion. How are we going to do that? If we're talking about college-educated individuals, maybe we're going to use more of a uh, Facebook online computer type of uh, marketing, whereas we're talking about, or look, if we're talk, trying to sell something to older people, so we're trying to sell something to somebody that's in their 60s. In fact, um, I notice this all the time. That's how I know that I'm getting old because I notice the TV shows that I like. The commercials are all about, oh, are you on Medicare? Do you need, are you having, is your knee hurting you? Do you need this? I'm like, uh oh, I'm getting old because now the shows that I like are trying to hit me that way. Whereas what? If we're talking about, so if you're trying to sell something to someone older, it's going to be more television advertising, more print advertising, someone more in your demographic, then maybe we can use more Facebook, that sort of thing, right, uh, type of advertising. So all of these things uh, we need to think about. Place, utility, where are we going to distribute that? That's actually kind of interesting, too. Um, you know, you go to the Nordstrom in um, Walnut Creek, you see a certain quality of product there, right? You go to the Nordstrom, I was in... Uh, I went to the Nordstrom in, um, where was I, Ogden, Utah. Uh, I went to, uh, I spent quite a bit of time in Ogden, Utah because the Internal Revenue Service has a, uh, has a service center there, just like there's one in Fresno, there's one in Ogden, Utah. What the federal government has, has done over the years is places where there's low employment, et cetera, lower incomes, they try to put a federal institution like an internal revenue service center right in the middle of that area to help uh, help the economy right in those areas and so you end up going to wonderful places like Ogden, Utah when, when, as an auditor we were auditing IRS and so we would always end up in these places where there was federal inst installation so I get to spend time in Mississippi I get to spend time in hot spots like Parkersburg, West Virginia all of these different places, Beckley West Virginia, where IRS puts their administrative offices. So all of these different places you end up. And so I remember I was in the Nordstrom in Ogden, Utah. And I'm like, is this Nordstrom? Because I'm looking at the quality of some of these products, and they're not that great. And then I'm realizing, oh, okay, they're doing what? They are placing the products based on what they believe to be the economic demographic of those areas uh, that are affordable, more affordable for those individuals. All of that is a part of marketing, okay? So we come over, and uh, running the four P's, we have the four C's. By the way, you know, I guess this is probably, you know, four, you know, like four P's, four C's? I mean, is that, uh, you know, something that's scientific? And no, um, this is just a way that this textbook is trying to organize these things to help you remember them, right? And so when I see something like that, please don't mess up on me now. Okay, good. When I see something like that, um, you know, I often uh, advise you to go ahead and uh, remember those couple slides because it might help you to remember, um, you know, the answer to some of the questions that we end up taking from the text uh, uh, test bank. So there's that one, the four P's, and then the four P's, product, price, promotion, and place, then feed into the four C's, which is what? Is our customer wants and needs, okay? So our product has to match that. Price, we have to what? Cost to satisfy. Uh, place, convenience to buy. And then promotion is communication. Okay, so you can see that these four P's that yield uh, different ways to uh, address these through the four C's. And, uh, 
I think that they could take a lesson on how to make these more readable. I don't know about the choice of colors here. This gets a little hard to read sometimes. Okay? Okay, good. So we come over. Is it just me or is that hard to read? Is it just me or is that hard to read? That would be a question. Okay, so uh, what? Number one here in the marketing process, identify a market need. Okay, then what? Conduct market research and develop a marketing plan. So, you know, what happens a lot of times is people will start with this first one, identify a market need, and then they will do what? They will jump all the way into probably doing what? Implementing they won't even do any of this. They'll go from identifying the market need to what? To spending all kinds of resources to actually try to get into that business and start selling something without what? Doing these uh, additional steps that need to happen. For example, yes, you may identify a market need, but you're going to need some sort of research to determine if there is a desire for, some, for whatever product you're thinking uh, or whatever service you're thinking will uh, meet a market need. Um, these days, this is pretty easy to do and then what? You can develop online surveys and then you just have to give people whatever the link is and ask them go in and ask answer specific questions about and you could ask them, do you think that you would like this product or this service? Where do you think this product should be uh, provided? Um, what price would you be willing to pay? And you get a lot of a lot of uh, rich information, and that is done pretty easily these days online, isn't it? Through things like this, uh, what's the name of Survey Monkey? We pay Survey Monkey. Almost anybody can use that now, and uh, it's a place where someone can go online and answer questions through the Survey Monkey, and it's a relatively low cost way for you to uh, get some marketing information. Okay, then what? Once you've done that, that'll allow you to identify your target market, your target market, okay, your customers, okay, then you can go ahead and do what? Implement the mix, the four P's and the four C's, and then um, you go ahead and once you have been successful in marketing that product, then you can go ahead and, uh, you know, maintain your customer relationships, okay? Um, now, in doing all of that, notice we have the uh, four P's, the four C's, obviously we're focusing on the customer, but of course there's always what? There's always the environment, the competitive environment, the regulatory environment, okay? What sort of, uh, you know, regulations are going to be involved in this? Um, the economic environment, hey, you know, uh, maybe there's a need for a restaurant right now, but uh, we're hitting a recession. And so this is not the best time to open up a restaurant because people tend to what, cut back on you know, additional costs like restaurants and that sort of thing during a time of recession. Let's wait until we're more in a recovery mode so that we don't sort of become a victim of the economic climate or whatever. So you think about um, these uh, not are considered in a vacuum. You have to consider what's going on uh, generally in the uh, economy, et cetera, when you make these sort of decisions. Okay. Uh, the marketing research, okay. uh, again, define the opportunity, develop the research design. Again, um, I'm thinking online is the way to go with these things these days, but then you're going to collect that relevant data, analyze the data, and then uh, act on conclusions. And uh, sometimes you run into, what, what is this? Everybody's got a weak bladder this morning? Okay, so then what? Then you go ahead and you start to analyze, implement the data, and then you act on the conclusions. Okay? Okay, good. Now we come over and we talk about primary and secondary sources of data. Okay, primary sources, observation, surveys, uh, I think experiments might be a little over the top for what we're talking about, but clearly if you're dealing with some sort of medicine or something, 
then what? Then we're going to be in a situation where uh, we have to do more intensive research like experiments, interviews, focus groups, and you can have an ongoing effort there in that you're starting to get uh, customer feedback or you're asking customers that you already have sold one thing to about their uh, feeling for a sec uh, another product. Uh, secondary, um, you know, internal corporate information, trade associations, um, this is a good way to go and, um, you know, listen to uh, other companies that are providing uh, some sort of service that is similar or hearing about uh, growth in the area that you might identify a need for. Um, government data. If you pick up something called a comprehensive annual financial report for a government, say the city of Fremont or something, there's a section back there called the statistical section. And in the statistical section, they give you data about items that were sold in that, in that city, sold in that county, uh, what the general price was, demographics. I mean, those comprehensive annual financial reports, that statistical section is something that is just chucked full with information that when I look at it, I'm thinking, well, this is good information uh, for, uh, for marketing. And then uh, social media, et cetera, and they're putting this as a secondary. I don't know that uh, I guess by secondary they mean once you already have a product out there, but uh, I'm thinking that this is a growing uh, area uh, for you to get information that's useful for the marketing of the product. Okay, uh, social media and uh, research, okay? So what's going to happen here? Um, social media, reduced research cost. You don't have to develop a, survey and that sort of thing, shorten uh, project duration, you can gather data much more quickly, less static marketing in that you can target your marketing to individuals that have already shown an interest in a particular product, a particular uh, area, okay? Um, and so some of the benefits, of course, are increased sales, uh, brand insights are improved, uh, enhanced research and development. Yeah. Okay. The marketing plan, okay, once you have the marketing plan, it is a written document, okay, what is the clear, uh, the uh, marketing objective, we do a SWOT analysis, where we talked about SWOT analysis before, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, we'll think about those things, selection of a target market, again, we're going to target individuals of a certain age, certain demographic, etc. Implementation, evaluation, and control of our marketing mix. So uh, once we go ahead and we uh, implement our strategy, we'll evaluate that and then we'll control our marketing mix. Remember our four P's, our promotion, our product, our price, etc. And we're going to uh, you know, do that it's, it's ongoing. It's not a one-time thing that is ongoing. But all of this would be in the marketing plan. And then we would analyze what we have here. Um, in our, they call this a situation analysis. And we say, we're the company. What does our company do? What are we selling? What are our strengths and weaknesses? So that's sort of the introspective part where you're looking at that as you're trying to uh, get in a particular area. Um, then what? Collaborators. Who are you working with? Uh, what other businesses can you work with? How can you grow and foster relationships? Who are the customers? Target market. Um, who are the current customers? Am I selling what they want? Competitors. Okay, you're going to want to think about that, obviously, if you're going to want to get into a particular market. So if you plan to be the cost leader, um, you know, get the lowest cost, then you have to look at, well, what competitors are out there that are also offering, uh, focusing on price. And if you feel that you don't match up well against those competitors based on price, then you might want to say, well, instead of price, I'm going to provide a spa treatment type of thing. I'm going to give the customer everything from A to Z since that price leader is already focusing on their basic needs and focusing on price. And so you may uh, look at that. And then what is the climate? Okay, what's going on in the industry? Laws and regulations, current economic environment, how are all of those things uh, going to affect me? Okay.
Okay, good. Uh, when we look at target markets, we can look at them by geographic. Okay, we talked about that last time, looking at the geographic aspects, demographics, age, etc. Um, psychographic, is what they call this, okay, which is lifestyle, personality traits, uh, motives, values, and then behavioral. Uh, benefits sought, volume usage, brand loyalty, price sensitivity, product in use. And a lot of this behavioral now can be just obtained by the fact that they've already bought a similar product, etc. So all of these are uh, things that we think about uh, income, uh, again, being obviously uh, a big part of that. Okay, consumer behaviors, the way individuals, organizations search for, evaluate, purchase, use, dispose of goods and services. Um, knowledge of customer behavior helps marketers select the most profitable target markets and implement the uh, marketing mix. Uh, consumer buying process. Okay, so the consumer first obviously figures out, hey, we need something, right? Um, now look, you can drive this a little bit, can't you? You go to the grocery store, and what do they do? They put a, you know you're waiting in line, so they put, you know, the National Enquirer magazines or something right there next to the checkout stand because they know you're bored and they want to hook you to start what? Sitting there and reading something, maybe you'll go ahead and pick that up. So, you know, you can drive the need recognition a little bit, but essentially what? The customer is pretty much going to do that on their own. They'll probably get information, and so that's why you're going to want to, you know, set things up so that when someone searches on laptop computers or something, and you can set up in your Google search, so yours will come up first, okay, on that um, evaluation of alternatives, and then purchase or no purchase decision, okay, and then post-purchase evaluation. Now, when in here can the customer change their mind and not buy your product? Which part of this can the customer say, I'm not going to buy the product? Huh? The customer can make the decision not to buy your product in any one of these. The customer can say, ah, uh, you know what? I don't really need that because of price, maybe, right? Okay? The customer can do information search and say, oh, you know what? I don't think that this is really meeting my needs at this point in time, so you're going to have to what? Make sure that you're addressing what their potential needs are, right? Okay? Evaluation of alternatives. Well, I'm going to get A because it does this instead of B that only does that or will cost this, right? Uh, purchase, no purchase decision, obviously, you can make your decision point there. Now, post purchase evaluation, how can they change their mind there? Return policy is going to be driven there, isn't it? Okay, the return policy is going to be driven there. And you say, okay, we'll just don't have a return policy. Well, then you'll probably lose them up here at that point, right? So anywhere along this continuum, the individual can change their mind, right? And as a consumer, I'm always annoyed that what? Oh, they love you for what? For 30 days. You're their best friend. All of your calls go right through. You get some real help on the phone, and as soon as you're past the 30-day period or whatever for return, now you're on hold for an hour, right? Okay, but uh, you know, um, this is a consumer reality. But uh, this is why that happens: is they're trying to uh, keep you through this process. Unfortunately, they tend to uh, break off sometimes towards the end, or once they get past, where you can still change your mind. Okay. okay, good. Um, let's take a look at what influences decision making, uh, social, cultural influences, uh, family, peers. How important is this one? How important is this one? Um, when I was looking at that uh, equipment, that was going to put in my living room that they started trying to charge me for every single device. If you want speaker one, 
here's speaker one. It was a home theater. Here's speaker one, and we're going to charge you for an installation of speaker one. We're going to charge you for installation of speaker two, speaker three, speaker four. They had a different installation charge for every single speaker, right? And I'm sitting there at first, and I'm saying, okay, well, I really want this. And then what started happening? I started hearing my dad's voice in my head saying, oh, they're ripping you off. That's a rip Why well, are they charging you for every single one of these things? And that was probably the main reason that I decided not, my dad was not there with me. I said, I hear your voice in my head. Common part of the He was actually dead when I was saying that. But he wasn't there with me. I heard him in my head saying those things. And so this is a big deal, isn't it? Okay? Psychological motivation. Why are they buying this product? Uh, situational influences. Um, uh, physical and social surroundings, type of product purchase, marketing influences, price, there's our four P's, and then what? Uh, personal influences, age, emotional situation, lifestyle, personality. If I had just hit the lottery, you know, I'm in a whole different lifestyle at that point. I don't care about those installation charges, right? And so uh, all of these things affect what the buyer decides to do, okay? Okay, good. Uh, differences between B2B and B2C. B2B is what? Business to business. B2C is what? Business to consumer. Okay, so if you're selling something to another business, what happens? You're going to have fewer customers. They tend to buy a larger volume, so instead of selling you one printer, a business, instead of a business buying one printer, they're going to buy a whole network of printers or something, right? Uh, geographically connected, uh, more professional and rational in purchase decision, highly trained buyers, okay, uh, complex buying decisions, business to customers, more customers, smaller volume, less sophisticated, and what? tend to be, you know, just a one-time purchaser. Hey, I'm not a uh, stereo, you know, home theater uh, 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 equipment uh, expert. I'm just doing this for this one time type of thing. Right? As opposed to, uh, if I was a business, I would have a more experience in repeated purchases of the same type of items. Okay, good. So, um, let's take a look at some of these questions. Form utility refers to a product that is produced from what? Raw materials. We go from a sheet to a sweater, right? Okay, which would be the form utility. Middleman is a distribution channel that we sometimes talk about as wholesalers. Um, so if you're selling to wholesalers, um, for example, you're not selling to Safeway, you're selling to a cereal a cereal wholesaler who will do what? Then go ahead and sell all these different types of cereals to Safeway at some point, right? So that's considered a wholesaler or a middleman. So maybe you'll first sell your product to a wholesaler who then turns around and will sell that to the ultimate retail outlet. And of course, when the retail outlet sells that to what? Sells that to the customer, okay? Uh, which of the following is not a good way to develop a rapport with clients? Um, a, establishing relationships with other businesses that cater to the same clientele. Now, that's a pretty good way of developing a relationship with your customers, isn't it? Okay. For example, textbook providers are constantly trying to get me to adopt their textbook. Notice they're not talking to you, they're talking to what? Talking to me, but when you really think about it, you are the ultimate purchaser of the textbook, right? So by maintaining a relationship with me, they're maintaining a relationship with what? With you in that way, okay? So they would go ahead and establish relationships with um, other businesses or individuals that cater uh, to the same or ultimate client. Responding to suggestions from customer on how to improve their services, obviously that's a good way to develop rapport with clients. Providing high quality products without a money back guarantee? I don't think so. If there's no money back guarantee, what's going to happen? Someone's going to say, okay, well I'm going to go with a company that offers my money back if I'm not satisfied or will give me a free 
uh, repeat <coughs> policy if I don't achieve whatever the reason was that I bought their service. Whatever, right? Okay. Offering decisions to a few selected customers, obviously, is focusing on uh, customer uh, rapport with client. Creating a Facebook page is a way, although it could be annoying, but uh, it is a way to do it, and then figuring out how to link up that, uh, that uh, news feed to an individual who's already expressed a certain interest in a particular area, whatever, right? Uh, without a money-back guarantee, the answer to this question is C. That's correct. Answer this question. I put the I forgot to grab the answer. The answer to this question is what? The answer to this question is going to be C. For example, um, Microsoft should have listened to me when I said that I don't understand why I have to sit here and I can't turn off the feature of when I click on the uh, page that it changes the page for me because I'm not that fancy. I know when I want to change the page and I'll change it. I don't need to have something so fancy that I sit there and I have to click on the page to change it. Can I turn that function off so that I don't have that annoyance? And Microsoft says, no, you can't. Well, why? Why can't I turn that feature off? Why do I have to have that feature on? That's not developing good customer relationships because I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, geez, I can't wait till the product that gets developed that doesn't do that, and that's what I'm going to use instead of Microsoft. situation of a client that really, really likes you for some reason. Okay, because that goes against um, whoever's theory is of, of, of each individual. Adam Smith, Adam Smith is rolling over his grave because Adam Smith is saying, why would that person acting in their best interest go ahead and turn that best interest over to you? You sure this wasn't a family member? I mean, I always turn down the, would you like the extended warranty? I mean, I always turn that down, but they charge you for that, right? And I'm talking about, you know, someone saying, you give them a money-back guarantee, and they say, oh, no, no, I, just, I don't even want to hear about that. No, I don't want to fill out the yes, I'm interested in the money-back guarantee. <laughs> you know, they're going to take that if you're going to give it to them. But if you're going to charge them for it, then we start getting into what? Utility, yeah. Um, because I always turn those down, because um, uh, they say you're supposed to turn them down, so I always do. Um, this particular computer that I have right here, I turned back, I turned down the money back guarantee. I got it at Best Buy, and um, the very, the very first time I used the computer, somehow the screen got cracked, and so once the screen was cracked, the machine was thinking that it was being touched and it wasn't. And so I using I had used it one time. So I went back to uh, Best Buy and I said, hey, you know, I, it, was, it was outside of the warrant the warranty period. I say first time I used it, first time I took it on the road and used it and it didn't work when I used it for a presentation. I said, hey, I'm past the 15 day warranty period, but this thing cracked already and they wouldn't take it back. They said, well you should have bought the uh, the extended warranty, you could have brought it back any time that we would have fixed it. So uh, what I did 
was I went to the home theater people because I had bought a bunch of home theater stuff and I said, hey, what is this? I'm a loyal customer. I come by here. Every time I buy electronics, I buy it back from you. And now they do this. And so what they did was they retroactively let me buy the insurance and then I brought it back under that. But I had to use some sort of, you know, uh, I don't know what you'd call that, pressure on somebody that I had bought a lot of stuff for. And so that person was doing what? was trying to develop a rapport with the client and so then what well, then I go back there when I was gonna buy the other stuff until they started trying to make the money with those uh, different charges. But I had already bought another T V from that guy, etc. Right? And I go back to that guy now every time I want to buy something, he's the guy I go to, right? Uh, so but most of the time uh, they do that they they just like after warranty. I don't really want to return it, but if you call uh, like uh, outside of uh, uh, the company, customer loyalty, that's what they call the Yeah, that's true too, you can call the customer loyalty, and that's why they have all of these they things, do, right? They do all of that, and yeah. they help tell you what you do in time. Yeah, where they can, there's sometimes they're pretty good at helping you with stuff. So, anyway, and that's because they know that there's competition and that, et cetera. Okay? Okay, good, let's take a look here. Um, what? Blank shifts such as age, gender, gender, ethnicity, marital status, and changing laws can uh, signal opportunities of a uh, business, and these are all considered what? Demographics, right? Okay, we pay close attention to those, and we, in, establish, in establishing our target market, these are all key considerations, right? Okay, guys, that's it for what, chapter 12, okay? Uh, we're not going to get into chapter 13 today, um, so we will pick that up when we come back next week. Um, as I mentioned, um, we are not having to turn in that public debt project, but uh, you're probably going to want to... Um, be keeping track of that and I did go through that last time it was some suggestions so I'll put that up as well as the uh, lecture from last time in this lecture as well so you can see those and we'll just continue on on Tuesday okay uh, have a good uh, holiday and if you were at the uh, presentation for the um, transfer day please come and see me now so I can give you the appropriate credit for that if you